Throughout human history, the exploration of ethics in media and culture has taken many shapes and forms. Often, viewers are presented with scenarios that bring into question the moral integrity of the characters, challenging them to determine for themselves who or what is most culpable for conflict, and ideally, how they might circumvent these unfavorable outcomes in the real world. Take, for example, the encounter of Han Solo and Greedo, a brief exchange that in many ways tells us more about Han Solo as a person than most dialogue in the Star Wars films. Cornered in an unfavorable encounter with this bounty hunter, the famed pilot shoots and kills him. Certainly, bounty hunting and extortion are a matter of life and death, but many wondered if Han Solo's decision to shoot Greedo was justified self-defense or simply the act of a killer. In the years following the initial release of the film, changes would be made, adding a new shot, fired first by Greedo, forever skewing the true sequence of events, a change that, according to director George Lucas, was made to further justify Solo's behavior and offset the initial impressions that he acted maliciously. In the world of anime, a similar question can be asked of the series Berserk, in which the broken Griffith, once beloved leader of the Band of the Hawk, makes a bold and rather selfish decision to forsake the lives of his followers in order to be reborn as a new being of great power. Surely those who chose to follow him did grant him the right to make that choice with their lives, but his decision was also one of absolute cruelty. While his choice was seemingly unthinkable at the time, the long-term effects of his decision have arguably led to greater prosperity for the masses. In the wake of his comrades' suffering in exchange for his own salvation, people continue to debate whether or not what he did was wrong. Such scenarios are commonplace and often present throughout media at large in all cultures, but it is without question that the greatest of these quandaries exists not in the Mosesli Cantina nor in the fields of Midland, but instead in the echoing confines of a locker room. Hey buddy, I think you got the wrong door. The leather club's two blocks down. Fuck you. Ah, oh, fuck you, leather man. Maybe you and I should settle it right here on the ring if you think oh, yeah? that's tough. Yeah. Can you get a wrestle your ass. ass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Let's go. Why don't you get out of that leather stuff? I'll strip down out of this and we'll sell it right here in the ring. What do you okay. say? Huh? Yeah, no yeah. problem. Ooh, buddy. Right. You got it. Get out of that uh, jabroni outfit. Yeah, smart ass. I'll show you who's boss in this gym. Though it needs no introduction, the clip you have just seen is an excerpt from Lords of the Locker Room. Released in 1999, the film's fateful encounter between Mark Wolf and Van Dark Holm has plagued the minds of audiences for two decades. For years, viewers have asked the same question. Just who was in the wrong? It is with great determination and resolve that I say for the first time in 20 years, the truth of this encounter will finally be revealed. Let's review the scene once more. Our scene begins with Mark Wolf sitting on a bench rather aimlessly as Van enters the room. One might infer by his body language that Wolf is relaxed, with his shoulders slumped forward and foot turned to the side, but there is more to this position than one might notice at first glance. Note one foot above and one below. Typically when seated, an individual at rest would generally keep both feet on the same plane if they intend to remain in place for some time. By contrast, it's clear that Wolf is prepared to move. We can also see that his hands are in a sort of claw position. It's likely he has gotten done lifting some pretty serious weight in the gym, perhaps a deadlift or bench press. Whichever the case, he doesn't appear terribly sweaty, and as we'll see in a moment, there may be more to this attire that we can use to learn about his psychological state. The two briefly exchange looks as Van makes his way to the locker. Though we only get a glance at Van's expression briefly, his face reads like that of someone who is having a somewhat rough day or who would, at the very least, prefer to be left to himself. It is at this moment that Van breaks eye contact and places down his bag. Opening his locker, he takes another look back at Wolf, expression unchanging. Now, typically, one might notice someone staring at them as they enter a room. That isn't terribly unusual. But it is here that Van sees Wolf has yet to stop staring at him. Cutting back to Wolf, we see him placing his bottle down on the bench. Just seconds ago, both his bottle and towel were beside him, meaning that Van's sudden appearance, for some reason, prompted him to interact with these objects. It is here that Mark Wolf delivers the first words of this encounter. Hey buddy, I think you got the wrong door. The leather club's two blocks down. The intent behind this statement is questionable. 
Perhaps Wolf is sincerely alerting Van that he is in fact in the wrong place, but it is more likely that this comment is meant to be taken as playful locker room banter. Some might think that the use of the word buddy may be an attempt to disarm the statement from being interpreted as malicious, however it is also worth noting that Wolf is Canadian. For this reason, the word buddy is not used with the conventional English meaning to indicate friendship, but instead as a sort of generic placeholder to refer to another person in a sentence, particularly one he does not know. Regardless, at this point in time, the remark is arguably playful and meant to be amusing. It is here that we get Van's first remarks in this exchange. Fuck you. Tone, body language, facial expression, and of course, choice of words, all clearly tell the story. Darkholm is not amused by the comment. As we'll see in just a moment, this negative feeling will very suddenly become mutual. Ah, oh, fuck you, Leatherhead. Standing up and choosing to say the words back to him, it's worth noting just how immediately Wolf gives his response. Normally, in a misunderstanding like this, one might attempt to defuse the situation. Instead, Wolf not only repeats the same words back to him, but also adds the leather comment once again, reinforcing his initial comment was meant to be aggressive. Wolf also rather quickly throws his towel aside with no regard for where it lands. It's clear that this response has struck a nerve somewhere. Wolf makes his approach, and notice how swiftly Van adjusts his stance in response. Also take note of his facial expression. Let's observe how this plays out. Maybe you and I should settle it right here on the ring. Oh, yeah? Yeah. As we've just seen, Wolf makes the proposition for some sort of bout between the two as he closes the distance on himself and Van. This tactic is a form of aggressive body language called invasion. Particularly, the tactic used is called approach. As described on changingminds.org, the closer you get, the greater your ability to use a first strike attack, from which an opponent may not recover. While you may well not intend this, the other person may well feel the discomfort of this risk. Interestingly, Van reciprocates the approach and meets Wolf on his own terms, just a few steps away from his locker. This is where things take a more concrete turn for the offensive. You get it is worth noting that this is the first time either participant in this exchange has escalated it to a physical altercation. This is what is known as the fight or flight response, a typical reaction in which an individual makes a snap decision in response to some sort of danger. <laughs> as we can see, Van chooses to put his hands on Wolf first, and Wolf very quickly returns the exchange with a shove of his own. What is most significant here is the expression on Wolf's face. While Van has consistently shown signs of discomfort, disgust, or disdain, Wolf pretty clearly smiles in response to being shoved before shoving back. Note also the manner in which he places his hands on Van. More of a playful slap compared to Van's rather direct shoves. It is at this point that Wolf once again proposes the duo fight. Let's go. Why don't you get into that leather stuff? I'll strip down out of this and we'll celebrate here in the ring. What do you say? Yeah, yeah no yeah. problem. Ooh, buddy. The two continue their exchange while Wolf continues to pursue the terms of the match. Interesting is the specific word choice of Van. He uses the word buddy, perhaps a callback to Wolf's initial remarks. This may also imply that Van has still not moved on from the leather club comment from the very start of the encounter. You got it. Get out of that uh, jabroni outfit. Note the body language once again as Wolf breaks away. Van is in a ready fighting stance, indicating he fully perceives Wolf as a potential threat. He does not break away until he is certain Wolf is out of striking distance. Wolf, by comparison, shows his back to Van rather swiftly. Perhaps confident in his own abilities or underestimating Van, the difference in the mental state between these two is rather clear. This is another aggressive form of body language called exposing oneself a technique often used to coax the opponent into making a move. We'll also hear Wolf once again chooses to insult the attire of his opponent as Van calls him a smartass. Yeah, smartass. I'll show you who's boss in this gym. As each undresses in their own corner of the room, Wolf makes this final remark. The undertones are fairly significant. Wolf intends to assert his dominance in this venue. Let's go! Yeah. Huh? Two, you got. Come on, come on. Yeah. 
At this point in time, the consensus might typically be that Wolf initiated the conflict, but Van was first to escalate it to an actual physical exchange. What matters most here is the incitement and the intended message. Recall in the beginning of this exchange, the altercation starts because of Wolf's statement regarding the Leather Club. This in itself is harmless enough. It is Van who opted to directly assault Wolf verbally with foul language first. Similarly, Wolf is the first to directly move toward his opponent, while Van is the first to physically engage. So then, who was in the wrong? Unfortunately, from this clip alone, there isn't enough information to confirm which, as the escalation of the incident can be attributed to either party. We need more information, so we'll now be taking a look at a second clip from the same film, and with it, we will be able to determine precisely who is culpable for the encounter between Wolf and Van. Let's take a look at the clip. Hey, excuse me, big guy, did you hear some uh, noises going around in here a couple minutes ago? I was in the other room working out, and I just heard, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I just finished wrestling some jabroni here and uh, knocked them out. Jabroni? Yeah, some guy, some guy wanted to challenge me in a wrestling match. No, no, yeah, no. What about one, two, three? Nothing. No, what, what, what's with the jabroni thing? I mean, I'm half Italian, so I'm going to sound well, like an Italian. Oh, I don't know. No, this guy thought he was pretty tough, and uh, really, you know, nobody could take me, so I, uh, you know, took a couple rounds out of him. Well, you know, most Italians do think that they're pretty tough. I think I'm pretty tough. Yeah? You think you're pretty tough? Well, I just had a match, you know, a little tired, but uh, I thought it was going another round. As we just saw in this encounter, Mark Wolf comes face to face with Billy Harrington. Note that once again, Wolf has used language that is directly offensive to the person he is speaking to. Additionally, he has placed the blame for the previous encounter entirely on Van, disregarding the fact that it was his own suggestion that the two engage in a wrestling match. This is what is known as High Conflict Personality Disorder, or HCP. As explained on the Psychological Care and Treatment Center's website, a person with HCP initiates and receives reward from conflict with others, and they are usually at the center of whatever conflict is occurring. They appear to treat conflict as normal and expected in their interactions, to a point at which conflict becomes a defining aspect of relationships. They are adept at escalating conflict and blaming others. At the same time, they have great difficulty seeing things through the eyes of others, and they are extremely reluctant to take responsibility in their lives or to accept blame when things go wrong. They are often referred to as chronic blamers. They tend to be emotional, aggressive, mistrustful, and controlling. They easily see themselves as victims, and they are extremely resistant to acknowledging that they may have contributed in even the smallest way to making a situation difficult. That's what you're into. You want to, uh, Listen, I was shot. in the other room. If that's what you call the match, I got news for you, buddy. You ain't met nothing like me before. Well, maybe you and I should try and uh, settle with that. Uh, that that sounds like a ring right here. I got a little bit are, of time. Are you uh, sure? Are, are you sure you, you really know what you're getting yourself into? In both situations, we hear Wolf instigate the conflict through his use of language, be it playful or otherwise. Yet in neither situation does he at any point attempt to defuse or de-escalate. By contrast, Harrington raises his arms, a form of body language used to psychologically create a barrier between an aggressor and oneself. He also offers Wolf a way out of the conflict before it begins. Well, I gotta get my hair cut in about uh, half an hour, but I think you're gonna be next time. <laughs> All right, well, maybe you can do that after you come out of the hospital. Well, let's just give it a go. Really? Well, I think we should. You're a pretty big guy. Uh, you I'm know, a pretty big guy. I'm slow, you know. I'm a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm pretty quick, so. Well, what we'll do you want to bet for? It'll be a little. What do you want to bet for? What do you I don't know. Whatever you want. Well, what do you think? I tell you what. I seem to be the intellect of both of us. I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's bet your ass. I win. I take your ass. How's that? Yeah. Wait, well, you're gonna fuck me in the ass? Is that what you mean? You want me to, don't you? Well, whatever you want to do. If that's what you want to do, if you think you can beat me one, two, three, you know, yeah, you can fuck me in the ass. We'll go. You know what? I think you talk too much shit. Listen, I'm a Roman Greco wrestler. You want to just start off right now? Yeah, I can go on the ground and we'll start off. True. You want to go Roman Greco? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go. Buddy, let's go, dude. Confidently, Wolf does not back down. He displays signs of narcissism and delusions of grandeur. In the first fight with Van, he remarks that he will show Van who is the boss of this gym and despite having just completed a full wrestling match, believes he will also defeat his new opponent, even after being warned of his skill as a wrestler. All right, you know, you let me start on top, eh? You want to get on bottom? You know that's the point you want to be. All right. You got come on, man. <laughs> Taking this second clip into consideration, it is reasonable to say that the common thread between these conflicts is one and the same. Mark Wolf is responsible for not only the inciting incident of each, but also for further catalyzing conflict with his opponents, leading up to a physical exchange.
Though Van Dark Holm was the first to put hands on someone else, it was through direct provocation and, arguably, a preemptive form of self-defense. Wolf has no incentive nor any stake in the conflict. He has not been insulted or targeted for his identity or appearance, merely for his own rudeness. In conclusion, the answer is clear. In the case of Lords of the Locker Room, Mark Wolf was in the wrong. Though his opponents could have handled things differently, it was through Wolf's overconfidence and provocation that the encounters transpired to begin with. A very powerful lesson can be learned from all this. Language, both verbal and nonverbal, is extremely powerful and can lead to conflict just as easily as it can be used to resolve it. With this consideration in mind, the choice to both provoke and antagonize are common folly. Through sincere apology or admission of fault, even in cases of misunderstanding, the second thing one says or does is the only thing one can do to make amends for their poor first choices in communication. Remember that it's okay to apologize when you make a mistake. Sometimes it's the only way to achieve a peaceful solution. Thank you for watching. Until next time, this is Standpie. You got me nay nah.